All right. Thank you very much for joining. I'm sorry for the delay there. We had a slight technical glitch. Let me introduce myself. My name is Linda Abraham. I'm the president and founder of Accepted.com. I also want to introduce Deborah Saltzman. She is my assistant today, and she will be handling the technical matters and, and answering any uh, technical questions you may have. Now, I'm going to discuss some principles you want to keep in mind as you write your essays, um, an approach to the essays, and lots of different things connected with writing outstanding MBA essays. One of the things that I'm going to emphasize is the, is the importance and values of, of stories and storytelling. So for the moment, I'm going to start, and, and consequently, I'm going to start my presentation with a couple of stories. The first is about a middle-aged woman, let's call her Molly, and she tragically suffered a major heart attack. And as the doctors were working feverishly on her, she heard a deep voice call out to her. It was a near-death experience. And the voice said, Molly, don't worry about a thing. You're going to have another 30 years. And indeed, the doctors were successful. They turned the situation around. They were able to revive her. And she began to, to um, recuperate. And as she lay in her hospital bed recuperating, she thought to herself, gee, if I'm going to have another 30 years, I want them to be different from the last 30 years. So different in her mind meant a whole new Molly. And she decided she was going to have the works in terms of cosmetic procedures and surgeries, et cetera. Botox, facelift, tummy tuck, breast augmentation, you name it, this lady did it. The works, a whole new Molly. And she recovered from those plastic surgeries also. One day she was walking down the street, uh, not far from the hospital where she had been initially treated, and suddenly an ambulance came tearing around the corner, didn't see her crossing the street, and just rammed right into her, killing her instantly. Again, she heard that deep voice. And she said to this voice, but I thought you said I was going to have another 30 years. There was a pause, and the voice replied, Molly, is that you? I didn't recognize you. Well, not being able to recognize you in your essays can be deadly. There has to be a degree of integrity and sincerity to the essays. It has to be you in the essays. That's story number one. Here comes story number two. I'll let you figure out which one is true. Jenny Churchill, Winston Churchill's mother, was really known for her beauty. Her beauty, her style, her sense of fashion, her, her, uh, her charm. She was quite the woman about Edwardian London. As she aged, while the beauty might have faded, her interest in fashion and style did not. And one day, as a woman in her 60s, in the mid-20s, she was rushing to a tea party in the latest high-heeled Italian shoes, when she tripped and fell down some stairs, breaking her leg. Tragically, it was a bad break, and the injury turned gangrenous. Winston Churchill had to tell his aging mother that she was going to lose her leg. The indomitable Jenny Churchill simply replied, well, then I shall just have to put my best foot forward. Similarly, in your essays, you want to put your best foot forward, but you have to make sure that it's your foot because of the first principle, that there has, it has to be you. So those are two principles, those are two guiding principles, I think, that you should keep in mind as you write your essays. But with those in mind, and those as kind of the foundation of, of the talk, I have to ask you, what do you think is the purpose of the application essays? Are they mere padding for your stats, your transcripts, your job history? Are they just this meaningless exercise, that a hoop that you have to jump through to get into to business school? Let's take a poll to see what you think about that question. Can you open the poll, please, Deborah? Um, raise your hand. The poll is now open, and you can vote as to which option you think is correct. The essays are padding for your stats, which are the application elements that really count. Choose one. True, false, or sometimes true, and sometimes false. I'm going to give this a little bit of time to run. Let's give it a minute.
A few more want to vote? Another few seconds, then we're going to close the poll. Okay, let's close the poll at this point. So 19% said that the statement is true all the time, but they believe the essays are just merely padding for the other stuff that's truly important. 37% said it's false all the time, and 44% said it's sometimes true and sometimes false that the essays are padding. Most of the time, the sometimes is, is, is the correct answer. Most of the time, is, it, they, the statement is false. The essays are critically important. There are some people who, has, who have such a stellar profile in terms of uh, their job history, their, their transcript, and their GMAT score that they really have to blow the essays in order to get rejected. Um, or if they're applying at schools where their stats are simply much, much better than the average for that particular school. But, but usually, the essays are critically important um, in your applications to competitive schools where your stats are competitive with the other people that you're applying to, but not stellar. It, is, it would be completely incorrect to say that it's true all the time. I'm a little bit surprised that 20 almost 20% of you, 19% to be specific, um, thought that that statement was true all the time. And I hope that most of that response is just people thinking they're funny. So OK, now that we've discussed why, a little bit about why you don't write the, the essays, why do you write the essays? The essays have a threefold purpose. The first one is to provide a window into the real you. And that kind of goes back to the idea of sincerity and integrity in, in your essays. You want to, your essays to be an introduction to you as a real human being and person somebody that they would like to meet and have as a member of their class and, and a colleague in their school. The second purpose is to add insight and value to your application. You don't want to merely re uh, repeat what's in, your, what's in the stats and what's in the other parts, what's even in the other essays. You want each essay to add value. You want it to go deeper into your experiences and, and be more revealing of your personality. It's an opportunity for you to discuss your motivations, and the lessons you've learned from different experiences and events. And finally, your essays are a demonstration of your writing ability, your communication skill, because the ability to communicate is critical to business and to management, to leadership. So the essays are not padding, but pad. They're there to provide a window into the real you, to add value to your application, to your application and to demonstrate your writing ability. So we've discussed why. Let's turn to the what. What are you trying to create with your essays? Well, you're trying to create a human interest story about you. A human interest story is very different from the many reports you've written. You've written reports for business or for school, for work or for school. And you've certainly read many newspaper stories, which are basically reports of factual events or attempts to be factual. Um, they tend to be, again, reports tend to be impersonal. They tend to take a rather super, well, I don't know if superficial is, is the right word, but they're very analytical. They take a broad view. They try and be unemotional um, and very data-driven. Essentially, the job history, the resume, the transcripts provide the news and the reporting element of your application. They are the factual context for your essays. The essays, in contrast, provide the human interest element. They are like a feature story in the newspaper or magazine. They are personal, anecdotal, emotional. The human interest story is designed to capture an interest and sell periodicals. And similarly, your essays must capture the attention of the reader and convince them of your message, just like personal stories are supposed to do for a newspaper. They are supposed to persuade. They are supposed to engage. Now, remember, admissions committee members are human beings. That might surprise you. They're not computers. They're not automatons. And they, as part of their work, wade through mountains, but mountains of boring, trite, monotonous essays. They are desperate to read something engaging, something human, something revealing and persuasive. 
And like all human beings, they like a good story. So OK, now we've discussed what the, story, what the essays are. You're used to writing reports and factual presentations. Most applicants are not used to writing feature pieces or human interest stories. So how are you going to write this human interest story about you? The rest of the webinar will focus on how to create a human interest story that engages the admissions committee reader, that answers the question, that adds value to your application, and opens a window into you. Because the why, why are we going to have this goal? Because these are the essays and the applications that end up in the admit pile. Now, let's step back. We've defined the essay. But you're not writing these essays in a vacuum. They obviously are part of an application. And typically, you're going to write three to six essays of some schools. I think the, the most I've seen is nine essays for a school. That's IMD. So you're going to have to choose experiences to discuss. Um, and you're going to want to choose the experiences that best answer each individual question. When you put together the transcript and the resume and the essays, you want them to create a complete and textured picture of you. You want to choose different topics to answer each question, and you want them to complement each other. You don't want to focus on one key achievement or experience in multiple essays. That can get boring, much like the pictures on the screen. Allow each essay to bring out different elements of your background, your character, and your experience. Now, once you've decided what experiences to use, you're going to focus on each essay more specifically. And you're going to structure the essay. And we'll discuss that more later. You're going to write the essay. We'll discuss that more, more later. And you're going to edit the essay. And again, it's kind of going from the top of the funnel, broadly looking at it, and narrow, narrow, more narrowly into it. Editing will be discussed, perhaps, in another webinar. It's, it's not for today. You're going, you should approach each application separately. Don't group similar essay questions and write all related essays at once and then just kind of spread them out, disperse them to um, different applications. You need, again, approach each individual application separately so that you can focus on the unique characteristics of the school and match your experiences to that school. Then when you go to your second application or your third application, you can adapt earlier essays as needed and as appropriate to the to the, to the new application. Don't try and fit a square peg into a round hole. You might have to write some additional essays. But again, approach the applications application by application. I also want to take a minute to discuss the difference between the MBA goals essay and the personal statement that you probably wrote when you applied to college or perhaps when you applied to certain other graduate schools. The goals essay, on one hand, is the most common a uh, question asked on an MBA essay, on an MBA application. And it is different from the personal statement. A personal statement usually is a reflection of where you are at the moment and what has motivated you and influenced you in the past. What is important to you today, and how did that value develop? The goals essay, in contrast, is forward-looking. And the number one thing you need for a goals essay is a post-MBA goal. You need a reason for pursuing your studies now at School X. You need to have something you want to do after you leave School X, because the MBA degree is a means to an end and not an end in itself. It is very difficult, if not impossible, to write the goals essay if you don't know what you want to do after you finish your studies. Your goals essay can be anchored and should be anchored in past experience, but it is fundamentally a forward-looking essay with fairly specific goals. For more on that topic, I suggest you look at the previous web, um, webinar, um, Best Practices for MBA Admissions. Now, in general, in your application, um, I would recommend roughly a 2 to 1 ratio of professional to non-professional experiences. Business schools are interested in what you do outside of work, but they are more interested in what you do in, at, at work and your achievements at work. Once, and that, that ratio, by the way, is not cast in concrete. It can vary from person to person. Please don't, don't uh, fret if you have a four-question application and, you're, and the, the two-to-one ratio doesn't, doesn't work out properly. Once you have a sense of what each essay is going to cover, focus on the individual essays. Now let's get back to the structure of the human interest story. It has a very classic, very simple structure. 
It starts with a leader hook, which is designed to capture the reader's attention and make him or her want to read more. It's followed by a thesis statement, which is the core idea of the essay, and then the body, the bulk of the essay, which is where you would write material to support your thesis and anticipate possible counter-arguments or objections. And this is, that's the guts of the essay. And it's followed by a conclusion, where you wrap up your essay, and you may repeat or state the central idea or theme and remind your readers of key points. The structure is a possible structure for your essay. I feel it's an effective structure and an underused structure. Um, it is not one size fits all. It's not appropriate for every single essay or question. Okay, so let's, let's move on. The next step, now you know where you're going. The next step is to figure out what is the point of your essay. What is going to be the, the simple answer to the question? Now, the thesis can be stated in the essay and, and give the reader guidance as to what to expect in, in, in the essay. However, at the moment, I want to focus on the thesis as a guide to you, the writer. It is the main point you want to communicate. Um, an example of a thesis that I read last summer and it struck me as, as very clear and very good was a post I saw on Twitter by a Business Week reporter. And the reporter wrote, here's my Venezuela story condensed, quote, cheap oil hurts Chavez, close quote. And indeed, I read the article, and everything in that article was about how cheap oil was hurting Chavez. Actually, I don't think it was last summer. It was last fall. <laughs> For a sample MBA question, discuss a recent leadership experience, briefly outline the situation, and then describe your role, how you were effective, and what you learned. You could have a thesis statement, and again, that, that guides you. It does not need to appear verbatim in your essay, but it would provide your essay with a backbone and focus, and it would give you direction, it would provide you with the main points you want to make. If you're having a di difficulty developing your thesis, try using a because statement. Now here's a sample thesis, and again, it would not go into an essay. I am proud of leading my team in developing a new strategy for Acme manufacturing because Acme's profits have increased by 10% since it implemented the strategy. I achieved success despite being the youngest member of the team and because I resisted my own inclination to micromanage the engagement process and instead allowed other members to contribute to the refinement of my basic approach and the development of our final report and strategy. That mouthful is an example of a useful, useful thesis statement that should not go in your essay, but clearly could guide you in writing the essay. The clauses after the because, here's your because, become the points you may want to expand on. Well, one point you may want to expand on is increased by 10%, so the profits increased by 10%. You achieved your success despite the the youngest member of the team, and you resisted your own inclination to micromanage the engagement process. In terms of what you learned, well, I, that would flow very steadily from the idea that you shouldn't micromanage the process, and you allowed other members to contribute to the refinement of your basic approach and development of the final report and strategy. So here you have the basic elements in one very long sentence, again, that should not go in the essay, but it would give you, the, the um, writer, a lot of guidance in going forward. All right, so now that you have your central idea, how are you going to, to, to order it? How are you going to structure it? Um, I like to use your good old-fashioned outline, you know, Roman numeral, capital letter, uh, Arabic numeral. But it doesn't have to be. The point here is that you take some time to consider how you're going to order your points chronologically, logically, thematically, and again, to refine the examples you're going to use that prove your main points. You want to put your most important element at the beginning. That will be your lead, and we're going to discuss that in a minute. Remember to use facts to give context and to highlight achievement. Don't make the essay a restatement of your job history a transcript and use examples to prove your points. They are far more effective than declarative statements or unsubstantiated claims, and more interesting, too. Throw out anything extraneous that doesn't support your thesis. So if it's somehow gotten to the structure of your essay, ask yourself, does it support my thesis? If not, get rid of it. And then you write the essay. So 
I mentioned, I've mentioned a few times the importance of the opening, the lead. The lead, classically, is an anecdote, go back to stories, an anecdote, a question, a gripping description of a scene, a startling statement or statistic, or a quote. And typically, the beginning of the essay will determine um, whether your essay is read out of interest or obligation. So you're going to want to um, use your most interesting anecdote or tidbit at the beginning. Writers know, professional writers know, that a headline or beginning of the article, essay, sales letter, or ad determines its success. So you don't want to start with a broad, dull, declarative statement like, my most significant leadership experience is, or I want to do X because, or I want to earn an MBA because. What would be an example of an effective lead? Well, a story, a tense moment that led to an achievement, a crossroad in your decision, a point where you had to make, a crossroad in your life, rather, a point where you had to make a ma major decision, a day in the life that you envision after your MBA, or an image of something that is important to you. And then you can go into how that is important and how it answers, re relates to the question and, and answers the question. So that's the leader hook. And again, I don't think I can, I can um, overstate the importance of that in terms of somebody reading your essay out of obligation or interest. Um, no admissions committee reader is going to require an interesting opening, but they, as all human beings, will respond to it. Now what about the body, the main points uh, of your essay? This is the meat on the outline skeleton, the proof of your thesis is pudding. It's the main points you want to convey. So how can you convey these main points distinctively and persuasively? Well. As the slide says, use specifics and details. They will add interest and credibility to your essay, and if you use them wisely, they will distinguish you from your competition. Now, I'd like to ask you, if you to, to look at your, um, on, at, at your dashboard. You'll have a, the ability to raise your hand, and I'm going to ask a series of questions, and I would like you to raise your hands if you um, agree with these statements or not. Raise your hand if you have volunteered for a community service organization. Whoa. Keep going. Keep going. You folks are active. I'm going to let it go for another couple of minutes, a couple of seconds. Okay. Oh, it's still more. Oh, it stopped. All right. Well, we had 140. We had 140 before. Let's say 145 said that they, um, I don't know what's going on with that hand raising, but it was about 145 said that they volunteered for a service organization. We have 240 here, so it was about 60%, um, let's say. Okay. So let's start this again. The next question, Let's, can we clear that? OK, let's do the next question, will be, that was again, it was about 40%, on, 145 on the first question, 40%. You have, uh, you have worked on a consulting project. How many of you have worked on a consulting project? Can we please have a show of hands? I'm sorry, I hit the wrong button. Again, can we please have a show of hands if you have worked on a consulting project? So we have 241 people here, and so far 74 or 30%. I'm going to give another 10 seconds or so. Seventy-five, uh, that's 30, 32%. Okay, let's, um, let's say it's a third of you have worked on a consulting project, okay? 
So, and then the third one is, how many of you like to participate or have been active in arts or sports? Again, please, let's have a show of hands. Whoa, you are active, very active group. We're at 54%. Let's see how how many of you have done have done this. 57 percent, 58, 59. Do I hear 60? Sixty percent. All right. So let's go on to another slide, and I have um, put the hands down now. And raise your hand. This is a different set of questions. If you served as head of a construction team for Habitat for Humanity, can we please have a show of hands on how many of you have done that? Five percent. I'm going to give another few seconds. Okay, let's put the hands down. And the next question, how many, could you please raise your hand if you worked on a consulting project exploring market opportunities in Eastern Europe? I'm gonna give this another few seconds. Again, about 6%. 7%. Okay. All right, let's put hands down. And then the final one is you led a last place basketball team to first place in your company's intramural league. Five percent. I'll give another few seconds, 6%. OK, that's it. So now you have a question box in your, in your dashboard. And I, I would like you to use that question box to indicate why you, what is the difference between those, the, fir the first slide where I ask you to raise your hand and the second slide where I ask you to raise your hand. Because the results were very different. In the first set, the 40% of you had volunteered for a community service organization. Roughly, I didn't, I didn't see the exact percentage. A third had worked on a consulting project. And 60% participated actively in sports or music. For the last second three questions, 6% of you served as a head of a construction team for Habitat for Humanity. 6% worked on a consulting project exploring market opportunities in Eastern Europe. And 6% led a last place basketball team to first place in your company's intramural league. Okay, John said that it's general versus specific. I can't quite get the full name. Um, Shekhar Kamat said the amount of detail, the more specific in the second part, specifics versus details. Second set is much more specific. Exactly, you guys all are getting it. I'm not going to read them all. Thank you very much for your responses. But you're 100% correct. The first set was very general. And many of you could raise your hand, because many of you had, had done those things. So you completely failed to distinguish yourself. However, if you were more specific, suddenly you didn't, you didn't sound like everybody else, right? You, you, were, um, you didn't sound like everybody else. You couldn't, and, and you were distinctive. You were unique. You were an individual. So the same thing is true in the way you describe yourself, both in your resume, in, all, in your resume, in your interview, and of course in your essay. It's a topic here. Specifics and details are much more, more powerful and will help you distinguish you from your competition. So, in terms of how you describe yourself, are you an engineer? Are you, or are you, an environmental engineer? Are you a consultant, or are you a healthcare consultant? Um, are you in finance? Are, are you in private equity? Those are different. 
are you um, an asset manager, or are you in finance? I mean, there, there are all the kinds of different ways to describe yourself and to describe your activities. Choose the one that is specific. It doesn't have to be terribly wordy, and you don't want it to be wordy because you don't have a lot of space. But just realize that throughout your essays, the more, more specific you can be, not more wordy, more specific, the details that you use will be more powerful and interesting than all the, hy the hyperbole, the superficialities, and the platitudes, because it will distinguish you from your competition. And they will have the, the integrity and sincerity that you want to have in your essays. So keep that in mind. That's another point I don't think I can overemphasize in the, talk, in the course of this talk. In, in the body of your essay, you want to be providing specifics and examples and stories that support your thesis. Now on to the conclusion. The conclusion, and during the conclusion, you're going to restate or state the main, point you want, main points you want the reader to remember. You may want to summarize your theme or restate it or state it if you hadn't stated it earlier. I want to tell you a little story that I heard that kind of, uh, uh, for me, concretizes the, the value of, the, of this point. I heard it from a very, very uh, popular speaker who travels around the world giving, giving talks and presentations. And um, he said that he is very careful, since he sometimes speaks before the same audience multiple times, not to repeat a joke more than once every five years. Because audiences remember jokes very, very well. Anecdotes, he says he feels they remember them well, but not quite as well as the jokes. So he makes sure that he does not repeat those before the same audience more than once every two years. And finally, he adds, an audience doesn't really remember so well a really good idea or message. That he finds that is very important to repeat at the end of each talk. The same goes for your essay. The ideas, the points that you're making that you really want the um, readers remember, summarize. The other thing that you want to do in the conclusion is tie back to your lead. Allude to the opening. When you do so, it gives your essay a nice feeling of unity. And that sense of unity and completeness and planning, frankly, is one element in demonstrating, one way to demonstrate your writing and thinking ability. So we've already discussed the value of stories and anecdotes a lot. <laughs> use of specifics. I think that, that came out with that little experiment I did. And the human interest story structure. But there are other tools you can use to add interest to your writing, make it more appealing and engaging, and again, distinguish you from your competition. These techniques can add interest and personality to your essays. The first one is active, lively verbs. Now, active verbs, first of all, has a grammatical meaning. It means that you're not using, you're using the active voice and not using the passive voice. Uh, very simple. Uh, there's more on this on the website if you want. But the very simple example is the boy threw the ball. The boy, the subject of the sentence, is doing something. Or you can say the ball was thrown by the boy. The, the ball was thrown by the boy. The ball is not doing anything. It's entirely passive. The sentence provides the same information, but it's wordy. And if you have to wade through an, entence of, uh, an essay of passive sentences, it simply is uh, less informative, much wordier, and, and tends to present you as a passive person, not exactly the image you want to make. Secondly, active verbs are lively, vivid verbs. So for example, did you go somewhere, or did you travel, race, rush, stroll, meander, walk, drive, fly, proceed, move, depart, leave, or run? They all, all those verbs convey movement. They have slightly different connotations. You have to use them appropriately. But using synonyms, using active, vivid verbs, can do wonders for your writing. Secondly, use of metaphor, analogy, and image. You want to try, when appropriate, to appeal to the senses and to concepts that people are fam familiar with. Doing so helps your reader actually experience what you experience as you tell your story. Again, it will make your, that use of imagery, use of sensory language will make your writing more vivid and more um, engaging. At the same time, I have to uh, caution you to avoid cliches, which are frequently um, simply abused metaphors. 
Suspense is another technique that you can use to add interest to your, rate, to your, to your essays and uh, encourage your reader to read out of interest or curiosity and not just out of obligation. So how can you create suspense? Ask a question towards the beginning of your essay and don't answer it until the end. That's just one very simple, um, simple technique. Um, you can open up with a description of a scene that's somewhat intriguing, was a dark and stormy night. There are other ways. It's just, again, it's a technique that you may want to consider in writing your essays. And finally, have an awareness of irony in your essays. It's all around us. When things happen that shouldn't, don't happen that should, um, that's ironic. Um, I'll never forget the time one of my clients wanted to start his essay with a statement about his father being the most influential person, on uh, the biggest influence upon his development which um, is not uncommon, um, but the, the interesting thing there was that they were very much alike. And when he was younger, they obviously clashed because of their differences. So instead of starting out with this rather prosaic and pedestrian uh, statement, he started out with something a little bit more intriguing about his father, that he could sleep till noon. I'm an early riser. He considers walking to the car exercise. I can play tennis all day. Despite, and, and there was one other difference I don't remember anymore. And then he added, despite our differences, my father has been the greatest influence upon my life. So the, but there was an element of irony. There was an element of intrigue. Who is this person? Why is he, why if they're, they clash on one hand, has he been this, this, this influential? And of course, the rest of the essay went into that. It was a very effective opening. Now, writing techniques, be they the human interest story, or active verbs, or irony, are powerful techniques. And like almost any powerful tool, they can be abused. So I'm going to also issue some cautions. Use techniques and words to communicate effectively, to communicate effectively, not to be cool. Only use them to the extent that they strengthen your message and add interest to your write writing. Don't use them for their own sake, and don't use them all in every essay. It simply won't work. Make sure that they classify, that they clarify, and make vivid your writing. Finally, and I alluded this, to this a minute ago, you're going to want to be succinct. You are dealing with tight word limits. Um, you have a lot of information to convey. You want to use each word, all your essay real estate, as effectively as possible. It's valuable. So when I say be succinct, what do I mean? Well, it goes back a little bit to the idea of using the active voice as opposed to the passive voice, which I discussed a minute ago. It also means being aware of, of certain lazy writing habits that you may have that will gum up your writing. For example, a lot of times there are words that can be used in a noun form or a verb form. Decision, conclusion. Well, did you come to the conclusion that, or did you conclude? Saying, I concluded is much more succinct than I came to the conclusion, or um, I made the decision to, or I decided to. So watch those verb-noun combinations and try as much as possible to use the verbs. Your writing will be more succinct and also more active. Finally, again, stick to your theme. You have no room for tangents, no room for by the ways. Again, you have tight word limits and lots of information to convey. So let's, let's review. I'm coming to my conclusion, and I want to wrap it up. So again, you want to provide a window into the real you. God should recognize you, and you should put your best foot forward. The essay should be, the, the reader of your essay should feel like they're meeting somebody they want to know better. Then you have a successful application and, excessive, uh, and, and essays that are effective, compelling essays. You want your essays to add value to your application and not merely repeat the stats and data found elsewhere. And of course, you want well-written essays that demonstrate your writing ability. As I mentioned, an effective and underused uh, structure for essays is a human interest story structure. It begins with a leader hook. It has a, a clear, well-defined thesis that is supported by the body. And the body is made up of, of meaty details substantive elements that are engaging, distinguish you from your competition, and support the thesis. And then the essay is wrapped up with a nice ribbon around it by your conclusion. You can also use the techniques that writers use to add interest to their essays. 
and to create your bold and brilliant essays, active verbs, metaphor, suspense, and irony. Now, Accepted.com can help you. We've worked with thousands of MBA applicants since 1994. We are currently offering an early bird special, which ends July 31st. For all MBA applicants, 15% off um, our MBA essay services. Round one deadlines are approaching quickly, earlier this year than ever. Now is the time to start on your essays, obtain experienced professional help from experts, and save money. You can learn more about our services in our catalog. You can learn about our staff in our About Us section, or you can contact Contact us online or by phoning 310-815-9553. I also want to mention that we are having a telethon next week, which is a, a free consultation, a free mini consultation that we offer uh, MBA applicants. You can find out about that, that online. It is on our homepage and was also announced on the blog. Finally, I'm going to we're going to start the Q and A in just a second. Second. If you are not interested in our services and still have questions, please feel free to contact us. You can reach us on the uh, accepted forums at forums.accepted.com or on Facebook at facebook.com slash accepted. Pose your questions there. We'll be happy to answer them and respond. Now, um, let's see. It's time for the Q&A. Um, if you have questions, Please post them, and Deborah, I think you're going to help me out and put them where I can see them very, very quickly. Okay, Humble Winner has kind of an interesting question. Do we use the same approach, lead, thesis, body, and conclusion, irrespective of the word limit, 300 or 100 words? As I mentioned earlier, the, the human interest story structure, the feature story structure, is not um, a one-size-fits-all. I do think it works better when you have 500 or more word, words allowed, um, and probably would not recommend it for a 300-word essay. That essay probably works better with a PAR, P-A-R approach, um, problem, action, result. And if you want on the blog, we do have, um, if you just search for PAR, P-A-R, you, you can find that and see what I'm talking about there, which would be more appropriate for shorter essays. Okay, let's see what else do we have here. Um, okay, Laksh Lakshmi, and I'm not going to pronounce your last name, please forgive me, Ask when the school asks for a reason for reapplication or a low score, what should the tone of the essay be? Well, the reason for reapplication is very different from a low score, so let's deal with the last one first. Um, if, if you're talking about a low GMAT or low, low grades, let's, let's deal with that. You want to be factual. You want to be succinct. You don't want to dwell on, on the, the weakness. You want to go take responsibility for whatever error there may have been and then move on. You certainly don't want to whine, and you don't want to go into some kind of lengthy apology. So the, the, folk, the, the tone should be factual. Uh, should be one of taking responsibility, moving on, and show, showing how you've learned from that experience or improved since then. Again, there are essays, there are, are blog posts, rather, on the blog about dealing with failure and weakness questions, or dealing with also an article on the website on, about dealing with a low GMAT or low GPA. Okay. Um, Okay, this I know is a question that came in a lot also prior to the webinar. 
This is from Tita Kao. How does being unemployed affect the candidate? Well, that depends on what you've been doing while unemployed. At this point in time, with the economy being what it is, with a high unemployment rate and, and um, many, many layoffs, then it's not a, a big black mark to have gotten laid off. The question becomes, what did you do during the layoff? Did you, if it was, did you quickly find another job? And then it's really just a non-issue. If, however, you were laid off for an extended period of time, what did you do? Did you acquire new skills? Did you volunteer? Did you participate in some community service activity? If you show that you use the time to grow and to develop, then it will be seen actually almost in a positive light. If you basically veg in front of the television, then uh, it's, it's going to be an issue. It's going to be a problem. Ironically, I saw recently a post from Seth Godin. Um, it was very demanding. And uh, it was an interesting perspective on what to do if unemployed and laid off. So if you are laid off, make use of your time, not just and I realize that job search is time consuming, but make use of the time to add to your skills, to take some initiatives to participate in a community service activity, and then it, it could actually be a plus. Now Deborah has also posted a couple of, of questions for me in the chat window. Um, these were questions that came in from people who registered prior to the chat. Um, one of the questions that she raises is, how do you demonstrate fit in essays, fit with a particular school? Well, the first thing to demonstrate fit is you have to know something about the school. You would want to research its strengths, its educational approach. Um, you would want to know what its values, what its curriculum is about. And most importantly, you're going to want to know why these distinctive qualities of the school are going to help you achieve your goal. How do they match your educational values and your needs? By tying the two together, you demonstrate fit. Okay, let's see some other questions here. Um, Should you explain a GPA in the additional essay, or is it best to avoid? Well, that de would depend upon how low the GPA is. If the GPA, I would say, if you have any Ds or Fs on your transcript, you should address it. If your overall GPA is more than 0.3 below the um, school's average GPA, unless it was just dragged down by a poor freshman year, then I think you have to address it. Uh, again, there is an article on the website, Low GPA, Low GMAT, I think is the title. You can do a search for it. It will go into more detail there. The, the key element in addressing the GPA, a low GPA, is showing evidence that you improved either later in your, in your college career or after college that you've taken courses and done well so that you can say, look, I was immature, I was stupid, I was going through a difficult family situation, I was working 30 hours a week. But in this case, where I didn't have those obstacles, I was able to perform and excel in an academic environment. And of course, the GMAT, is a high GMAT would reinforce that. Because the GMAT, in, in my opinion, shows uh, what kind of head you have, how, just raw talent and ability for business school. The, your grade point averages shows that you know how to apply yourself in an academic environment. Let's see, there are lots and lots of questions here. Let me see if I can fit another one. This is an interesting one from Prashant Rao. Most schools ask for substantial accomplishments. I have about five years of experience. Should I restrict my accomplishments to my work life or accomplishments in my college can also be included? Well, that would depend a little bit on the question. Um, in general, I would assume that your most impressive accomplishments were your most recent ones. So especially if they're asking for leadership accomplishments or, or things like that. If you go back six years to college and basically declare that your most impressive accomplishments occurred then, um, the reader might wonder, well, gee, what have you been doing the last five years? Uh, 
Um, so I w would not be inclined to do that. On the other hand, if your community service experience was primarily in college and you had some substantial, significant community service experience, then you may want to draw from a college experience from five years ago. But in general, when discussing accomplishments, I think you should really choose, uh, in general, don't go back more than two years because they're going to be wondering, what have you been doing lately? All right, Karina Matias asks, should I start working on the essays if I have not yet taken the GMAT? Frankly, as important as I think the essays, and I'm obviously very biased in this, in this question, I don't think you should be working on the essays if you have not yet taken the GMAT. The GMAT takes a, requires, demands a lot of preparation. You only have so many hours in the day. You don't know what schools you can apply to until you take the GMAT, because you don't know what score you're getting. And if your score is much below or much above what you're anticipating, your school choices may change. So focus on the GMAT. Take, do tons and tons and tons of practice problem. Focus on it. Get the highest score you possibly can. And then turn your attention to the essays. Or well, first choose the schools you're going to apply to and turn your attention to the essays. Um, let's see. Deborah also has asked a question, I guess called from the questions we received before the webinar. Um, if I have any good books to recommend for MBA essays, I have a great book to recommend. Um, it's written by Paul Bodine, except it's editor, and it is Great Application Essays for Business School. Um, it's been out for several years. It's, it's really, really a wonderful book on writing the MBA application essays. I recommend it highly. I also recommend we have a number of books, e-books, that are instantly downloadable for specific subgroups in the MBA applicant pool. We have the Consultant's Guide to MBA Admissions, the Finance Professional's Guide to MBA Admissions, and the, te and the Techies Guide to MBA Admissions. And these books focus very much on how applicants from crowded subgroups in the applicant pool can differentiate themselves through their essays. Okay, let's see what other questions we have here. Okay, Alok Verma asks, if I mention some tragic incident in my essay, would it appear to be written just to gain sympathy from the reviewer? Well, that would depend very much on what you say and what the question was and how you approach it. Um, if you come across appearing uh, um, as some kind of broken, tragic figure, you're not going to really help your admissions chances. If you come through as somebody who has gone through a tough period and grown from it, come out strengthened, then you're going to be come across as a resilient and strong person and therefore um, a, a very appealing candidate, not that that's going to ensure your admission. Now, at this point, I think I have time for one more question. Let me see what I'm going to do. Somebody asks, is a recording available for this webinar? We will post one in a few days. That's uh, Priti Malik. Um, Hari Chris asks, in, an essay, in essays which ask for cultural shock, can I bring out the topic of religion, or is it considered too sensitive and I should avoid it? Well, it depends. As, as, as so many of these things uh, go, it depends on what you say about religion. If you end up preaching religion, or you're very critical of somebody else's beliefs, then you should avoid it. If you're talking about how you responded to a particular cultural shock, or, or certain religious practices that you found strange, then um, it, it should be fine. Um, now, I know we started a couple of minutes late because we had a, a couple of technical glitches, so I actually am going to extend for a minute or two just because we do have a ton of questions and we started late.
Alan too asks, how do essays differ between full-time applications and part-time applications? In terms of the writing techniques that you can use, there really is no difference. The main difference is that at some point in the part-time application, you have to explain why you want a part-time program. That's the, the key difference. Look at some of these other questions. All right, Christine Asangbedo, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, asks, any thoughts on how you select experiences to write about? How do I know if an experience translates into a compelling story? Well, you can ask some people, if you tell the story and they, they smile and they're engaged, you, you would uh, have a good idea <laughs> if it was compelling or not. But I think in terms of your essays, I would look for stories or experiences, let's forget about stories, experiences that are most significant to you, most important to you, and most distinctive about you. Now, again, a story, almost by virtue of the fact that it's going to be specific to you, will, will be distinctive. But you know, if you wrote a story about going to the beach on Sunday afternoon, I don't think that's going to be terribly compelling. If you have a story about how you improve sales by 10%, to take the example from the thesis statement I used earlier, or you have a story about um, organizing a group to go camping, or you have a story about working with uh, an at-risk child, or you have a, an experience where you led a team to that, that developed a product that was a, a blockbuster in terms of sales, or you were on a trouble team that wasn't effective, and somehow you were the linchpin in that group and managed to turn the situation around. Any of those things, those experiences, would be, could, could be a, a compelling story because they are significant in terms of the context. You're trying to show that you are a future leader and manager. Um, they would be distinctive, and they would reflect. And obviously, they have to answer the question. That's, that's the other element here that uh, we can't forget. All right, I thought, want to thank you very much for attending. It's been a pleasure. The recording should be posted either late this week or early next week. I'll, I'll post it on the blog and on Twitter when it's posted. I want to remind you again of the early bird special, the telethon, which would be a chance for a free consultation next week.